Every time they tell me stop, I use Every comment, hate that makes my feel Gather up my energy and boom I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with Giving my blood so I am relentless We're here, the Keep Hammering Collective. I'm Cameron Haynes, and we have Dale Brisby with us. Welcome. Old son, it's great to be here. <laughs> At what age did you become a super puncher? Ooh, good question. Yeah, that's uh, that's the ultimate level of cowboy. So you got cowboys, you got top hands, ranch managers, and then you got super puncher. Right. And, you know, I'm going to say around eight-ish. Eight. Eight. You were a super puncher at eight. It's it's an ultimate level of cowboy that uh, essentially I have emulated my whole life. Yeah. So so you are the standard by all which cowboys are measured. You get me. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's exactly. What I, I mean, that's what I figured. I mean, for those that don't know, which I'm sure there's nobody, I'm, you are the guy every man wants to be and the guy every woman wants to be with. I think that goes without mm. saying. Yes. But for those that don't know, Dale Brisby is uh, one of the, I think, the most famous cowboys of all time, right? Rodeo I, cowboys. I, I would have to agree with you there. Yeah. Yes. You have a Netflix show. And I'm also the most humble. Yeah. So oh. they go hand in hand for me. No, I, I mean, when I think of you, I think of humble humility, if, if I had one word to describe you. So tell me about the Netflix show. What, what was your hope in starting that and sharing that lifestyle with everyone? Well, um, I, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, if I thought I'd have a Netflix show, I'd, I'd, I'd have told you yes. And, uh, <laughs> when they called, the first thing I said was it's about time. Uh, but they just wanted a glimpse of not only Dale Brisby, but they wanted the cowboy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And really, all the networks are seem like they're at least right now on the hunt for a cowboy show because uh, that's that's kind of what's cool. Yeah. And um, um, Chris Ledoux had a song, has a song. It's you know you just can't really you can't see us from the road, and everybody thinks the cowboy way of life is dying, but it's mm -hmm. not. You just can't see us from the road. Well, then Snapchat. Over the last few years, the internet has shown people this world that um, has existed all along. Right. And so that that was what the Netflix show is called, How to Be a Cowboy. And I have at Rodeo Time at the ranch, we have a uh, intern program, and so that show tracks two interns that are working for us still, and uh, they're learning how to ranch and learning how to rodeo. Yeah, I I watched. Uh, the first episode, I believe last night, was that the one where the girl was trying to get on a, on a bull yes. and she had hurt her knees and yes. th I thought that was, I'll, I have to admit, I must be the only one who didn't know you had a Netflix show until yesterday, but it was great. I mean, it was funny, entertaining TV. She, I liked her personality. Of course, your buddy's on there too. Um, seems like I feel late to the party, but I love it. Yes, sir. She's, uh, and she still works for us. She's a killer. She, uh, there's not a lot of female bull riders. And mm -hmm. so she's been inspiration for a lot of young girls and, and, um, it, it's not the most popular event for females. Um, tough. And it, it is, it's, it's tough, tough on you. And, and, you know, in her, her words, listen to her explain it. You know, a lot of the girls that you do see doing it are kind of more there for attention. Mm -hmm. But you can tell with Jordan, she's actually passionate. And so she works at it and she treats it like a like a true passion. And so it, it's 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 awesome to watch her compete. And then Donnie, he's the other intern in that show that rides Bronx. Yeah. And it, you just can't fake the buck offs that happen in that show. Yeah. Like. You know, there's so much that goes on in the six episodes that was just too real. Like, there's just no faking it. And, well, um, but now Donnie's riding Bronx and winning rodeos. And really? He's still at it. Oh, man, that is awesome. So, what, what do you think is it about the cowboy lifestyle that is, like, kind of got people's attention now? I think, you know, well, at just at first glance, it's pretty interesting to get to do what we do from a top of horse, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's like a, you know, the Q and a last night was, it was kind of funny. That guy was like, well, do you think you could shoot a bow from a horse? And it's like, well, we do a lot of other things from top horses. You know, yeah. you, you, you're gathering cows and you're, you know, you're roping and riding and not to mention, 
you know, the rodeo events, but that alone, you know, is, has an adrenaline factor, just an intrigue to it, but there's a romance side of it that where you, you, um, you know, you're a shepherd, you know, you're, you're taking care of cattle and, and you're a provider for, uh, not only your family and, and those around you, but the, the country, mm-hmm. you know, where we would be without ranchers is, uh, most of the beef, you know, that, that's, throughout the country is smaller ranches. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some big, you know, you got the four sixes and the King ranch, but most of the beef actually comes from people with less than 50 head. Hmm. And so the small town rancher is, is still a large portion of what provides health and nutrition for the, for the country. Yeah. And that's, I mean, your story of course highlights that, but I saw even on Yellowstone, they're trying to get in or not trying to, but they're sharing not only the lifestyle, but then also the, the cattle ranching part. And yes, that's sir. kind of transferring over. You mentioned the four sixes and I think you've worked there yourself, but they're talking about raising beef and selling it and how that whole process works. And we spoke about that yesterday, but, uh, what is it about the, the cattle industry that you think is misunderstood? <sighs> Much like the hunting industry, there's a lot of myths, you know, I I think a lot of people just assume that we don't care about animals Mm -hmm. and like, like a a true hunter, you know, like you, you can't go through, you can't read your book, endure and not see just the passion and love for an animal pouring out of it. You know, Mm -hmm. you can't make that stuff up. Right. And that's the way we feel, you know, like my horse Boone, he's 20, going to be 23 in April and. It, it, it'll be a sad day, week, month, year when I have to say goodbye to that that friend of mine. And, um, you know, I've got a bond with that horse. That's the probably the big myth is that we don't care about animals when mm-hmm. it's actually the opposite. I, now, I was raised that there there is a place for animals, mm-hmm. you know, and animals are not more important than humans. Right. Yeah. And that is just, that's in, I believe that with all my heart. And, and so you, you, let's say I, what, whoever my enemy might be, you know, like just, especially like the world being divided on politics, people joke around, like, which would you choose this person or the dog? Like I'm yeah. going to choose when it comes down to it, I'm going to yeah. choose the person, right? You know, people are more important than animals. And so I, I have that at my, in my foundation. However, I care about animals. I want things to be, if I'm going to go hunting, I want that to be as humane of a, you know, harvest as possible. Yeah. And, um, uh, that's, that's probably the, the big myth is right. that I would argue that we probably care more about animals than mm-hmm. most people. Yeah. I mean, and think about how amazing that is. You mentioned dogs and horses, but those animals specifically, how incredible is that bond you have with a dog and then a horse, you, you mentioned the things you do on a horse, but the bond you have with your, with Boone for 23 years, but look at what people can do on a horse, you know, from, right. from hunting to obviously herding cattle to checking fences to just, I mean, covering country. Yes, I mean, sir. amazing amounts of country. Horses are incredible. Um, those two animals, I think, I don't know, the connection with man has been, it's unbelievable if you think about it. Yes, sir. And this journey that man has with a horse and a dog is... Uh, I don't know. What do you, what do you think about that? When you think of, um, the connections with those animals for you and being a cowboy? Well, a lot of people might think that it's not necessary Mm -hmm. to have a horse because there's, and and like a four wheeler or a Polaris or something. Well, and a lot of cows will come to, you shake a feed sack, but when you get on a larger operation, Mm -hmm. uh, even the smaller ones, there's always one or two cows that won't. Yeah. But, um, those bigger, those bigger outfits, like you honk a horn and it's a big enough pasture. They can't, I mean, they're not going to hear it. Number one. And some of them are wild enough. You just have to have a horse. Yeah. And the jobs I've had in the industry, you can't show up a foot. You Mm -hmm. have to be on a good horse because we're going to gather these cows. And if it's in Texas, it's got to happen fast because it's going to be 110 degrees by lunch. And so, um, it's, it's not only necessary, but it's mandatory Mm -hmm. to have a good horse that, that you're able to get the job done on. Right. And so that, that bond that you have with them, it, it's, it's going to happen no matter what, but it's, it's a fun job mm-hmm. and Yellowstone does a good job of showing the romantic side of it where it's, it's enjoyable on top of necessary. Yeah. 
but um, but at its foundation, to get everything done efficiently, it, it's it's necessary, and that's the thing. You know, it's a this is a for profit undertaking. While a lot of ranchers usually just break even, but mm-hmm. you want to get the job done smoothly and efficiently, and uh, and that requires horses on most operations. Yeah, what if you show up to the four sixes to work? What makes you stand out as a cowboy? So, you know, being there, number one is work ethic. Mm -hmm. If you're lazy, like it will be sniffed out maybe the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. Like you're just, you're just, if you're lazy, you're not going to last. You will not get invited back. Mm -hmm. And they'll take that work ethic and uh, just a humble attitude over somebody that's maybe a top hand with a rope. So it's not necessarily always the top hand that might get the job it's somebody that's willing to do every job right so you'll you'll take out the trash you'll you'll clean up camp you'll you know because when you're in the branding pen everybody wants to be roping Mm -hmm. well if you're the guy that will you know volunteer to flank all day which is super exhausting on some big soggy calves when you got 300 in a morning to do what does that mean to flank all day so uh, when you brand in the spring, you'll get all the calves in a pen and, you know, whether it's 200 or 400 calves in this pen, two guys will ride in and they'll heal the calf mm-hmm. and, uh, they'll dally on their horn, out on, the, on their saddle horn and then ride towards the fire. And, um, usually it's, it's at a pretty slow pace. So mm-hmm. it's, it's not like rough. It just, it kind of lays the calf down. We'll just then dragging them over there. You drag them to the yeah. fire mm-hmm. and then two guys will hold that calf down and, mm-hmm. And you hold them in a, in a there, there's fundamentals to it. So you can do it a right and a wrong way. And when you do it the right way, it's, it's less stressful on you. It's not as tough mm-hmm. as it sounds holding down a 300 pound calf with two guys. If and you do it correctly, that's flanking them is yes, holding sir, them down. Them. Okay. Yes, sir. And, um, cause there's a couple different ways, depending on how the dragger ropes him. Mm-hmm. Usually if he catches two feet, it's super simple. Sometimes if he catches one or high on the hawk, it's a lot tougher on mm-hmm. your, on your flanking crew. But um, if you have a good attitude and you're willing to work hard and you just like, oh, bring him anyway, you know, one leg, whatever, and then you you just do your best, you get him on a side, and then you, when the job's done, you smile and you ask for another one. Yeah, you know, those kind of guys right. are who make it as not only on the four sixes, but but in the cowboy world in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's just like any other industry. You know, if you've got a good attitude and you work your butt off, you'll get invited back. I see. And you'll be successful. So how did, so you got started in the industry and I guess was it, how did, when was it you got into rodeoing and how, where did you work on a ranch before that or how did it evolve into where you're at now? So my, my dad, when I was born, uh, my dad actually was working on the pitchfork, oh. which it neighbors the four sixes, like mm-hmm. they share a fence. Mm-hmm. And uh, similar in sizes, uh, p- sixes is a little bigger, I think. But So we we worked on the, the pitchfork and we were at West Camp. Mm. And so I was kind of born into that lifestyle. Um, and we moved away from there and my dad was also a rodeo cowboy. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up, you know, dreaming of working on the pitchfork one day and if i wasn't doing that then i was rodeoing Mm -hmm. and he did all things rough stock which is like bareback saddle bronc bull riding Mm -hmm. he fought bulls and he picked up and like any you know son oldest son or whatever age son actually I, i wanted to be just like my dad yeah and so um i got on any sort of bucking stock i could as quickly as i was allowed to when, and, how old was that? I mean, we were getting on calves and steers whenever we were little. I got on my first bucking horse and bucking bull when I was like a like a sure enough, you know, bucker when I was fifteen. Okay, and uh, never really looked back. Hmm. And did all the rough stock events. Like, if there's two ends of the arena, the bucking shoots are on one end, and it's those three rough stock events I talked about: mm-hmm. bareback, saddle bronc, bull riding. You got your bullfighters and your pickup men. And then the other end of the arena is the timed events. So your mm-hmm. team ropers, calf ropers, barrel racers. Those are all timed events. These are the rough stock is scored events. Mm-hmm. So I just I just lived on the buck and shoot side of the arena, hmm. and it's kind of segregated, but it's it's also we're all cowboys. 
do so. do one side look at the other side and kind of like a sideways glance like oh those guys are the I mean, is there's there a always hier- riff. There's, there's a hierarchy. Yes, there's always riff. And, you know, they've got challenges that we don't. And we've got challenges that mm-hmm. they don't. And, you know, like we just ride in a car and get there and, you know, like our, our the bucking stock's already there. They yeah. got to haul their horse. And oh, right. They've got challenges that we don't. We also have doctor bills that they don't have so <laughs> well they might have doctor bills for their horse for their animals oh they do yes right? vet bills yeah because which, running those horses like that i mean just sprinting on any animals right. tough so keeping a horse horse healthy is probably a challenge and all the time they spend in the trailer that's the main one you know okay. just beating down you know going you know if people come up here to pendleton from texas that's mm-hmm. like 15 1600 miles right so so that alone is is kind of the the wear and tear on a on a good rodeo horse right and what's how old can a rodeo horse perform do you think i know levi lord is a team roper and i think his horse was 24 at the nfr last year wow and so when you take care of them Mm -hmm. they can you know and some horses have it in them some of them will age different you know yeah boone couldn't handle the nfr yeah i still ranch on him a little but he's 23 is that's an old horse. Yeah. And is he a quarter horse? He is, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that what those guys are using mostly for the roping events as quarter horses? Because yes, yes, they're sir. fast? The, the the way that a quarter horse is built, it's got it, it's it's able to have the agility it needs, but mm-hmm. but also str- big enough and strong enough. You get into the bucking horses and they're gonna be more draft. Mm. You know, they'll be big and yeah, soggy, mm-hmm. you know, and so, and so the pickup horses will sometimes be a little bigger so they can get in there and bump up against Jessel. them. And yeah, it's so, so fun to watch those rodeos. It's getting I me mean. pumped up just, think, just <laughs> describing it. Well, what, what makes a good rough stalker? I mean, Bronx bulls, what makes somebody <sighs> good at that? So we touched on it a little bit yesterday and there's fundamentals to these events, mm-hmm. you know, like in saddle Bronx, for instance, if you get bucked off, you were either not lifting on your bronc rein or you mm-hmm. weren't keeping your shoulders behind your hips. Mm-hmm. So if you get bucked off, you weren't. it was because of one of those two fundamentals. And so, okay, well, let's get on a practice dummy and do that a thousand times a day. All right, well, that's great. Then you get on a bucking horse and the gate's about to open. And we talked about how you, you say in your book how the mountain is pure. Yeah. And it, it, it pretty much washes away any trash talk. Well, when that gate opens, it's the same thing because yeah. that that horse is gonna he's gonna fight. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to a SEAL Team Six guy. Uh, his name's DJ Shipley, and he was we were behind the shoots at a rodeo, and he said he had a lot of respect for what we were doing because as a SEAL, they're clearing houses. And he would go around the corner and he said 90% of the rooms, 95% of the rooms I would go in were benign. Mm -hmm. So I Googled what benign was and, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but, but they would be empty, but he has to, he has to be ready for that fight Mm -hmm. when he goes around the corner Mm -hmm. and he's got to execute. So emotions, emotions have to be in check. Yeah. And he said, you guys, every single time you meet that fight Mm -hmm. and that gate opens and you have to fight. Matter of fact, if that animal doesn't perform, they give you another one. It's called a re-ride. Right. So like you're going to get in a fight. <laughs> and um, I never really thought about that, but every bronc I've been on, every bull, like since then, mm-hmm. I, before I get on, I'm on the back of the shoots. It, I, it reminds me of that. But to make a long story long, to answer your question, like in my mind, the ability to execute the fundamentals in that moment is what distinguishes um, great bronc riders, bull riders from, and that's any pressure situation, right? But I think in the rough stock, it's 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 added because you might be coming off an injury, mm-hmm. or you might you might have a bad bronc that bucked off a former world champ recently, right? And that so that and then or or it's just a big rodeo for a lot of money, but you've got the added danger factor, and and that's what I. I just crave that moment. Yeah. When that gate, like it's so pure. Yeah. And if you are, if you can go there mentally to perform and then when you do, it's only eight seconds, 10 seconds, you still got to fight it after the whistle blows. So 15, 20 seconds, like it's such a pure and just, I wish you could experience You, you probably, you do, you get it with that. When you draw that bow back, you've got to execute. 
I don't know. There's something about getting on an animal though that, I, I mean, I, I would think that a lot of people like the idea of it. And then you said, when it gets to that moment and that shoot's about to open, <clears throat> I'm betting there's some people who are like, what am I doing? Yes, sir. And just try to, they know they're probably not going to write it. They're just going to try to not get hurt and just kind of maybe put on a little bit of a show, maybe like a Tim McGraw. What did he stay on for? <laughs> yeah. One point. Three, four, seven seconds. <laughs> you know bull name, fool man, too. I think a lot of people have that attitude. Just like, I'm going to get on a bull. And, yes, sir. You know, and then the elites or the outliers, as I like to say, are the guys who look at it like you and, and say, no, I'm, I'm ready. This is what I was born to do. And I'm riding this bull. And that's... I think that's exciting. That's, I don't know. I think it sounds great to be a bull rider or whatever. I think doing it is probably a lot different. I've been, for some reason, I've always, I've been in a position where I was always the guy locally that helped people get on their first uh -huh. bull. Yeah. And, um, and I, it, exactly what you just said. There's a lot of people that they just expect it to go well, and mm -hmm. then they get in the shoot and they're on. Because you give up control. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you're a bullfighter, you're on the ground. Yeah. When you're a when you're a pickup man, you're on your own horse. Mm -hmm. Even you know something like maybe bow hunting. Like you are in control of where you're standing. But when you're on top of an animal, you're giving up a lot of control. Yeah. And um, some people it it shakes them. You have to react, right? Because you aren't you reacting to the animal's movements one jump at a time. You, you can't control the animal, and there's no guarantees what they'll do. Mm -hmm. Some of them have similar trips each time. Yeah, but there's just no guarantee. And and you can, the most subtle thing like animals have leads, mm -hmm. meaning like they'll right hand left hand type yes, thing. I'm sure an you notice it with el an elk even like mm -hmm. he might be in a right lead or a left lead. Yeah, if they change leads. It could just buck you off if you're right. not ready for it. Right. If you're not executing the fundamentals. So you watch film on those bulls then? Yes. Yeah. But you don't want to watch too much yeah. because it might be a different trip. Right. So usually, you know, it's like you're watching film of the animal, but then you're also, you might be studying your personal route or someone else's. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's such a, it's just a pure moment. Are you ready for it? Have you been getting ready? I did a podcast with a, world champ patrick smith the other day and he said confidence without preparation is arrogance mm -hmm. and and when that gate opens we'll see yeah how much you've been preparing <laughs> oh man i love challenges like that it's uh that's the true test you know life you can get through life pretty easy without really having too many challenges if you want these days it's pretty easy mm -hmm. but the people that face a challenge like that and the way i look at it is to anybody watching it or somebody who's not built for it or have that talent, um, it probably just is a blur. But I think about when you watch baseball and that batter's in, in the box and he's watching that pitch come in and he's watching the, how the ball's spinning. You know, he can yes, pick sir. up what pitch it is. Is that, a, is that a slider, fastball, curve? And this, like, in slow motion for them, they can see those, those threads on the – on the ball is probably the same for the elite bull riders is they can, that slows down and they can react to the yes, animal. Sir. And, uh, obviously not everybody's gonna be good at that Yes, sir. for most people to be a blur and they end up, you know, hopefully not getting stomped in the head on the right. ground, yes, but sir. that's where they are pretty quick. I bet. Because eight seconds feels like an eternity. <laughs> I and bet. so it slows down. I remember I was about to win Liberty, Texas and in the Bronx riding, and I love the rodeo and I'd been there before and done well in the bull riding, but I was about, and they played, it was like six seconds in, this horse got to the fence and the song, I can't feel my face when I'm with you yeah. came on like during, <laughs> during the, ride. the ride. And usually it's more of like in the bronc riding, at least, you know, it's kind of like some jock jam during the actual, they might yeah. play it between broncs, but yeah. like during the ride. And, and I remember thinking like, they don't play this song that often. <laughs> and this horse changed leads, took a right at the fence and dumped me on my head on the left. Oh. And it was just, but it was just such a, like, it, I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. I can see the horse. I can see the bronc rain. I was like, you don't hear this song that often. I had this conversation <laughs> like, with myself. Probably not what you're supposed to be focused on. Maybe uh, that a thousand br percent. broke that concentration. But I was just. That's not really your fault though. Right, I mean, exactly. Right, I don't. Which it never is. I'm going to count that as a ride. Thank and you. And actually, a ninety. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I you mean, get I, me. But <laughs> I was, I was tapped off, as we like to call it. Like oh. felt good, and I was like, "This is going so good." And then yeah. I, I was like, 
I can't feel my face. I was like, <laughs> I still think about that night because. And in eight seconds, all this is happening. That's, all, yes. that's what's amazing. Yeah. Right. It's uh, what a, what a special sport. I mean. And the guys that are the greats, the thing that they're able to do is because a lot of guys can find that spot and have a great ride. Uh huh. But being able to do that every single out, yeah. every rodeo, when you're sore, when you got in an argument with your parents, when you know the money's on the line, all those things, day in, day out, when, the, when, when you are consistent, that's when you can start to make a living at it. You build some momentum, and now you go to the NFR, and then you go to the NFR, and then you're world champ. Mm -hmm. That's what those greats are good at. Yeah. You know, like, like yourself, having harvested however many, you know, just an incredible amount of bulls like that nobody else does. Well, like you're able to execute fundamentals consistently. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what, that's what delineates the goods from the greats. When, when you first started, how, how heavily weighed in was buckle bunnies and why you wanted to be good? <laughs> <laughs> Did cowboys think about that, right? Um, yes. <laughs> they do. It may be a lot of guys like main focus, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of, you know, pretend bull riders that are pretend bull riders just for the sake of the buckle bunnies, you know, like, yeah. and you better believe if I'm out at the bar, I'm going to make oh. sure this buckle here is seen, you know what They're I mean? not going to miss that. Yeah. Th those girls aren't going to miss that thing. When'd you win that? Uh, this year. <laughs> I don't know if you can read it, re read lady, but. <laughs> Most of them can't read. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, buckle bunnies are an important part hey, of rodeo. I'm, I don't need them to read me a story. I don't care if they read. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll do the reading. You just look pretty. Yeah. No, yeah. they, you know, the, the, the after party of rodeo, you know, all these rodeos, when you go to a town, that is that town's, maybe it might be their carnival, their, their stock show, their, their, you know, but that's their party for the year. Yeah. And uh, so many people, the committee and all those people, they, they're the backbone of rodeo because they're putting on that event that where you're going to make some money and make your living. And, but each night you may get started and be at a rodeo on a heavy weekend, start on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, that'd be a full weekend. Yeah. Usually Thursday through Saturday, but right. sometimes Wednesday through Sunday. Well, that's, that's five nights of parties yeah. when you go to these towns. Right. And so you can see guys get get really into the afterlife of the after party of, yeah. you know, because they each got a beer tent and yeah. they are, you're the celebrity. Right. Just being entered makes you a celebrity in a lot of these towns. Yeah, I bet. That was never my, I love, I love, between the national anthem and the the final song, like yeah. that was my that's what I'm most passionate about. Okay, when I'm when I'm smelling that arena dirt, that freshly plowed, like that's what gives me chills. And mm -hmm. I'm there for the for the for the Bronx and the Bulls, and 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 I enjoy the hospitality tent, and I try to yeah. do my. But I mean, I like to chase girls too, but <laughs> but I was at those rodeos for the for the for the actual thrill of getting on a bucking bucking no, animal i don't doubt it i just know as a as a fan you know that's kind of the big draw too is it's like you know the wrangler bus drive me nuts the yep. girls the it's like man it seems like rodeo bring brings out the cream of the crop for whatever and, and town you're in it doesn't it's just any size it can be a <laughs> podunk little oh i thought you're gonna say any size of girl oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> those the big girls are good too it's, yeah it's yeah. good they make rancors in big sizes the larger buckle bunnies yeah they all need love um <laughs> no the any size rodeo you know like the small town sometimes the smaller the better yeah. you know like the big rodeos are great you know houston pendleton cheyenne the nfr those are so fun mm -hmm. but also just the you know 500 added little you know duck off we like to call them yeah the duck offs that you know, they might have a Ferris wheel in the background. Those are, that's, that's America in yeah. my opinion. And you could get a tough draw at one of those little ones too, right? I yes, mean, there's sir. probably some rank animals, bulls, <laughs> mean horses at even small rodeos, I'd guess. These days there's rank bulls everywhere. Why is that? Because of the PBR. Okay. So you've got rodeos that are, um, they're all the events. And then in the 90s, a group of guys started the professional bull riders mm -hmm. and, you know, Tuff Hedeman and uh, a lot of those guys, 
uh, Cody Lambert, Ty Murray, they, they, a bunch of guys put together the PBR and it, it's just exclusively bull riding. And, um, that created kind of a wave of, of, uh, buck and bull breeders that started really. And then now there's also buck and bull competitions. Mm -hmm. So like the ABBI is an association where bulls can compete against bulls. Right. They might not even have a rider on them. They might just have a dummy. Oh, really? And so you can win money as a stock contractor. Oh, okay. And so through all these little programs, the buck and bulls, you can go to the, that $500 added podunk little carnival mm -hmm. ride, bull ride I'm talking about. Yeah. They will have some quote unquote juice cats as <laughs> oh, we might call it. Like they'll have some buckers there. Like that, you better cock your hammer if you're in a bull ride. Juice cat, huh? Anywhere. Sometimes <laughs> you'll find a stock contractor that will cater to some guys that are coming up and they might have just some, some duck spinners, which yeah. is not a juice cat, you know, like I need a duck spinner. That's what we would give a yeah. beginner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a juice cat, what does that mean? <sighs> You like a cat because it's so wiry or what? You, yeah, you would just have to like, I mean, they would have everything, you know, a lot of, that's not like a common term. There's some bull riders <laughs> out there shaking their head. I heard it like <laughs> twice one time. Oh, okay. Cody Whitney said it. But anyway, <laughs> like a juice cat would be like, yeah, just a bucker. Oh. Yeah. Just juicy. Yeah. Juicy. But I, then also like athletic because it's got that the yeah. mountain lion isk to those, it. They yeah, had those big bulls that are athletic, man, that's got to be tough. Yeah. So with power and being fast, they would call some of those like the, like a dragon. You know? Yeah, they called that's why they would call JB the Dragon Slayer because in the PBR there's there's points where you you pick your own bull, and some guys would pick bulls according to their level because they yeah. wanted to get a qualified ride. Okay, because well JB would pick the baddest really bull. I never really went to PBRs. I was, I'm always like a rodeo guy because yeah. I'm also involved in bucking horses. But mm -hmm. like those PBR, like JB would, he always picked the baddest. Hmm. And uh, is that that's just his personality. That's he, his personality. Like he wants to ride the. And in his words, when I asked him about that on a podcast, he said nobody remembers 85 point bull rides. Mm -hmm. And it's the most gangster. <laughs> I made a little. Most guys would be happy with 85, wouldn't they? Agreed. Yeah. Especially when at one of those events, most people buck off because yeah. all the bulls are. So if you can average an 85 point, yeah. if you get 85 at every road, you're going to be a world champ. Yeah. But he's not just trying to just ride, you know, get a qualify. He wants to be the best. And so like Bushwhacker. Put on the show. Bushwhacker is arguably one of the rankest bulls of all time. Mm. And like he was... They say he was ridden once when he was like real young, like a two year old. But other than that, the only other time was JB rode him. Really? But he got on him, I think 13 times. Oh my God. But he, and because he kept picking him and kept picking yeah. him. Well, and then finally one time he rode him, I think he was like 94 points. Ooh. But he just, he's asking for it. Guys yeah. don't ask for that. Right. 94 though. And so that's, that's why they that's call JB score. the Dragon Slayer. Oh, I love it. And that's why we're best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, second to you, you right, being right. my best we friend. We are best friends. Right, 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 right. right, right. So, yeah, and you're, is he in Texas? Is he, is he, he is. your Texas best yeah. friend? Right, yeah, exactly. That's what it is. He's my bull rider best friend. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. <laughs> you're you're my bow hunting best Bow friend. hunting training partner. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'll take that. Um, did, you see, did you see that ride, that 94? I mean, not live. No. No, sir. But you saw the tape. If you're if you're in the industry, you've you've seen the tape and really? seen the replays of it. And yeah, he's 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 got all kinds of videos out on the internet. Most of them he some of them he doesn't even know about. You know, like he's just <laughs> he's a he's a celebrity in our industry. Oh man, I know. I've I've watched a video of a couple of videos of him, but he just seems like the ultimate badass. I yeah. mean, love his attitude. It's like as you say, gangster, that's what I think when I watch that. He's a Marlboro man mm -hmm. and doesn't work out a lick. Like it, he would, he would be great to have up here, but I don't, I don't know if he would, he says that he goes in a gym and he doesn't see anything. He doesn't <laughs> see anything that resembles bull riding, <laughs> but like, he's just got this killer mindset and yeah. what he does get ready for bull riding is get on bulls. And must just be a genetic freak. He's, he's built for that. He is built for it. I don't think he's a genetic freak. It's a it's a mind thing. Really, it okay. is. And because we say like, or I joke, 
Lyle Sankey jokes. I stole the joke from him. Bull riding, and I think he stole it from Mickey Mantle maybe, but bull riding <laughs> is 90% mental and the rest is in your head. Right. And we talked about it yesterday. Yeah. Um, I say that unless somebody is maybe out of shape. Yeah. <laughs> and they want to run bulls like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yours is going to be, you're going to need to do about 20% physical. Right. But, but anyway, once you do get to a certain level of physical yeah. fitness, it's all in your head. Well, he's got to be strong though to h- hang on that bull, right? Well, he'll get there strong. by getting on bulls. Oh, I So see. like there's a bull rider, you know, like, I mean, back in the day, he would talk about getting on eight, 10 bulls yeah. in one practice session. I guess it'd be like, so for me, I get good at killing bulls by killing bulls, right. but I can only do that for one month out of the year. If I could do it all year, man, I'd probably be pretty dang good. <laughs> if I yes. could do, so it'd be like, like he's able to ride bulls all year. I can only kill bulls for 30 days, but yeah, so it'd be the same philosophy. It's like, I do all this training just because I can't go out and kill, Right. you know? So that makes sense. <clears throat> I mean, and, there, there would be no better way to get better than just doing it. And a lot of what you're doing in the, in the, you know, elk hunting, like you're putting your, yourself in a position to harvest large animals, which means you're going over mountains and everything, which you do that every day mm-hmm. for preparation. So you've got that. And I think probably in elk hunting, you go a lot of places people aren't willing to go. Um, I think they'll go, but they'll, I can just be at, a, a better level when I get there. You know, I mean, people could make, I mean, I'm, I'm not superhuman. People can go where I go, but they might be at 60% of their best and I'm still at a hundred because it ha- didn't tax me. So then I can just react and make better decisions just because I'm, I feel fresher. I know I can say, I know exactly what you mean <laughs> because after running the mountain yesterday, you and I went to the bow rack <laughs> And I was falling apart <laughs> trying to fling arrows in the bow rack. Wayne was concerned. Yeah, uh, you did. You did good though. I mean, you shot <laughs> shot really well. Was, yeah, Wayne, I got to take a break. I go into the bathroom <laughs> and either throw up or the opposite, and can then come back out shoot some more <laughs> arrows. I don't know. I I was I knew I was gonna like. I knew I was gonna push myself to finish. Like I'm mm-hmm. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna die. I'll have to die on this mountain before right. I quit is what I kept telling I'm myself. I'm glad you didn't die. But, um, but that didn't mean it didn't tax me. And when we got <laughs> to the bow rack, it hit me. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, you did good. Wayne, Wayne was concerned. <laughs> but but I, I, didn't, s- I didn't even know. He was like telling me, he's like, yeah, I'm, is, he, is he doing okay? And I'm like, yeah, he's, what do you mean? He's doing fine. <laughs> but, but I could see what you mean. Like had you and I been at the, in the mountain, yeah. like, and you'd have been in, you would have been perfect to draw back on a bull. Yeah. Whereas I would have been, I would have drawn back and uh, uh, my, my little pins would have been moving. And that's, that's the difference. That's what people, you know, a lot, there's a lot of people who say you don't have to work out to bow hunt, which sure you don't, but you're not going to be at your best. You know I mean? So I want to be, if I want to be at my best to deliver a perfect arrow, I better prepare for that. I, Cause I just, I just don't want to get there and then screw up the opportunity. I want to be able to take advantage every time. So that's the point to training for me. And that's what I tell my interns. Like, to be honest, like I was like, I, I will tell them straight up, like, please don't come here and think you're going to be like JB. Mm-hmm. I said, if you're not working between bulls, like I'm not going to let you get on mm-hmm. because it's too dangerous of a sport that if you're out of shape, if you haven't been getting on the drop barrel or, you know, exercising, stretching, watching video, if you're not doing work between bulls to get better, then I'm not going to just let you keep banging your head against the wall because Mm -hmm. there's no better. That's what it would be. You're not, it's not a wall. You'd be banging your head against the top of a bull's head Yeah, and that bull's head is going to win. Yeah. And so you can get better by just getting on bulls. It just takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And so my interns come in there at 22, 23, like your years are numbered. Mm -hmm. Like 35 is a lot, is an, is an old bull rider. Yeah. The clock's ticking. You know, and if you get married, have kids, if you're not making money when she shows up, then you're probably not going to be riding bulls very long. Right. Because it's a selfish undertaking. Yeah. And if if it's not a source of income, then she's going to probably not <laughs> enjoy seeing you go do this dangerous thing. Right. Yeah. For with, free. With no return. With yeah. no ROI. Yeah. Exactly. So anyhow, there's a lot to consider, but essentially like... Uh, yeah, JB is a freak in that sense. Yeah, but. 
Have you seen like any young guys come up that are, that you say are just, you look at them and you're like, wow, these guys are incredible. They're going to have great careers. Have you seen people like that? So I took, all, I've got Donnie got really good at riding Bronx really fast. Mm -hmm. And we went on a ski trip and I told these guys, they all wanted to snowboard for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I've been going on a ski trip a year my whole life. Yeah. And I started riding, yeah, I started snowboarding in high school. And so I've been on a lot of, and I'm finally picking it up, you know, and I tell these guys like, you can snowboard, just know it's a lot harder than skiing. So it's going to take you a while to get good. And it's a four day trip. You're going to use the whole trip. And then next year, like it's going to take you. Yeah. So we get up on the mountain and these three interns of mine that decided to snowboard day two, like they're catching up to me and passing me uh -huh. and like, just like blowing by me. And by the end of the trip, you know, they're just zipping down and mm -hmm. they're falling a little But And I realized like how little talent I had. <laughs> and like for the things that I've been passionate about, which snowboarding isn't one of them, that's yeah. just a fun hobby. Right. But I looked at all the things that I've, you know, with rodeo specifically and cowboying and horses, like I've had to work extremely hard mm -hmm. and it made me realize how little talent. I have. Oh, um, and so it's just the time. And so it, time it, it on the then it comes down to the work ethic. Yeah. Like you talked about in your book. Mm -hmm. And um, there are guys that have the talent to ride bulls and they can just mentally go there. Mm -hmm. But I think when they can couple that with the hard work and a good attitude, right. that's when they have an opportunity to be great. Yeah. That's, that's what they say is like talent. Usually people that aren't talented – or don't have that natural talent end up being better because they work harder because that talent people get by with that natural talent and they're just used to it. Yes. Used to being yes. good at whatever they do. They don't really have to work that hard. Yes, sir. So the guy who's got to work like you who, and grind and grind and grind, then you sacrifice more. So you want it more. So you're more committed. So you put in the extra work. You can end up passing the person with actually yes, more talent. I've got a, I'll, I'll just, he won't mind me saying his name, but one of my interns, Ty Rogers, he's, he's been like that. And mm -hmm. he came in and he looked at bull riding as, and, and it was interesting to hear him describe it like this, but he's kind of realized he's been looking at it like skydiving, you know, like it's this fun thing you do to get an adrenaline rush, but he wasn't. And so he's been riding this talent wave cause he can ride a duck really mm -hmm. well. Yeah. But then like you get something that's just a smidge above that and it'll buck him off and mm -hmm. it blows his mind. And, and I was like, Dude, you haven't done anything since the last bull ride mm -hmm. to get better. Right. And he's having this realization like, oh, man, like to take it to the next level, mm -hmm. I've got to add work ethic to my talent. And that was new for me because I'd never had talent. Like right. I, I wasn't going to ride a duck spinner if I wasn't working at it. Right. And um, and so he, it's it's crazy watching it develop in his mind mm -hmm. and and what you just said I'm witnessing and, and he started to work at it and he's excited. And, but on the other hand, there's also a, a realization that some guys may have that like, Hey, I, I don't know that I want to work that hard at this particular thing in my life. It's yeah. not worth that to me. Yeah. And in rodeo, like I tell these guys, if that's you, you better tell yourself quick. Mm -hmm. Cause if you, if you realize that deep down, but then you get on 15, 20 more yeah. knowing in your soul that it's not what you want to do. You're going to get hurt. Yeah. And maybe seriously. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. The stakes are too high. You yeah. can play golf for an extra year or two knowing you don't want to. <laughs> yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. No, you know, nothing bad's going to happen. But probably. not bull riding. Yeah. But yeah, there's big, big uh, stakes there. Yes, sir. For not being 100% in mentally and physically. Yeah. It's super interesting. I love, I mean, I love, and that's kind of the study of, like I say, outliers is because it's those people that have that, that talent coupled with the work ethic. But then also, as we've learned with a lot of different things, it's just time, time, yes, sir. years. And it takes years. The it's process. Like, when you look back on it after 20 years and you're like, you know, people might say where you're at now or whatever and say, oh, it must be nice to be Dale yes, Brisby, sir. to be, you know, this, like the most famous man in the world. They didn't see all the... Yeah, 10 years of videos. <laughs> yeah, 10 years of work. Nobody was probably watching, or I mean, the, the right. views were nothing. Right. Um, 
so that that would bring me back like you started rodeo young you what did you see watch your dad compete too i did yeah and that was that was we got to go to a few rodeos with mm -hmm. he just he he was terrified of getting old hmm. and it's 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 hard to see you know but like he 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 wanted to go and it's tough because of you know it's rough stock Mm -hmm. And so whenever you've got a family and kids and, and, you know, it's tough to take off and go to a, uh, get on a bucking horse. But I remember going to some of the last pro rodeos were Cleburne and, and Big Spring and getting to go to, and then later me getting to go enter those rodeos was surreal, but I watched him go to those and, and, uh, he even got on a bucking horse. This is unheard of, but he, he got on a bucking horse at 55 six months before he died. Wow. And he was 67 points and he got second. And no way. He was on cloud nine. 55 years old. It's unheard of. People just don't do that. Like it's no. like a news, uh, uh, they would like talk about that on the news in the local community that mm -hmm. night if it were. Um, and then six months later when he did pass, he was picking up at a rodeo. And uh, we, we, I remember like it was yesterday, but I had this, I think it's a blessing, but God had, I know that the Lord had been warning me that I was going to lose my dad early and I was going to a separate rodeo. I always went to that rodeo with him. It was Holotus, but I was going to Paris to a different rodeo and he was going to Holotus to pick up and uh, I shook his hand. I can still feel it in my hand. I can feel his hand in my hand more than I can see his face, but um, he just talked about, he had said like, I think I'd make more money if I just stayed at the house and ranched. And I said, well, I would never ask you to quit because he's 55, you know, and mm -hmm. he's still, and, and he said, I just can't, I just can't quit. And I said, mm -hmm. I get it. I'm your, I'm in your corner. I'm going to do the same thing. And he shook his hand and said, everything's going to be all right. And then, uh, when I left there, I cried my eyes out because I knew it was the last time I was going to see him. It was May 1st, 2013. And, uh, how did you know? I just, I don't know. I had, I just knew I was going to lose my dad early. And so for years leading up to that, I soaked in every single, I was not the young kid that thought his dad didn't know anything. Hmm. I cherished like everything this man said. There'd be sometimes he'd be talking about cows and we'd, it'd be just a Tuesday night and I would be taking notes. I remember taking notes, just him talking about cow calf and gestation and, you know, talking about all these different things. And I just cherished everything that he said and did. And I see young people like, I was like, man, you better soak it up, you know, because once they're gone, they're gone. And I was standing in the arena, and one of my one of my best friends, he's, he was like in the arena with him at that rodeo. He picked up the first guy, and then he just went down with him. And uh, anyway, he called me, and so I left my rodeo. And But he was just so terrified of getting old, and so um, – and it's crazy, like we, we – you know, we went down there and, um, it was days after that, that I realized I had not even questioned whether my dad was in heaven or not. Like it, it was, it was the first, it was the closest I'd come to death. And then it was like, Oh man, like it was as sure as like gravity, you know, like mm -hmm. we don't have to address gravity. Right. Like if I drop something, I mm -hmm. know it's going to fall. I don't have to think gravity is going to pull this to the ground when I drop it. Mm -hmm. I didn't acknowledge gravity. I didn't even have to acknowledge like where my, it was just like, that's where he is. And so that was the first time my faith was tested. And thankfully in that moment, and there's been times since then where, but when I think about my faith, I think about my old man, I think, I thank the Lord that he gave me that. I don't know what the definite premonition is, but mm -hmm. like that he gave me that you're, you're going to lose your old man early because it made me cherish every moment. And then I, I thank the Lord for that faith that my dad had instilled in me. Um, but I think you, we talked about it yesterday, how you die matters. And so yeah. like, that's his legacy. And he passed and strength and honor was a big thing between he and I, like mm -hmm. your book, like it was, I had to like set it down and just like look, look around the room and like, cause you were talking about Roy in there and you were talking about strength and honor and, you know, the godly man he was. And it was just so crazy reading that book and how many similarities there were and him passing, doing something he was passionate about. And mm -hmm. same thing with my old man and both of them taken a little too early in our eyes, but, but also knowing that it's almost like 
there were these perfect people and God was like, I felt like with my dad, I'm sure you didn't feel like this with Roy, but I was like, I'm going to take you up here before you mess up this perfect thing you got going. Mm, you know? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I, I think that's a, a gift that you have that perspective on to, to know how special your dad was to you and how you had that feeling that he was going to leave early gave you that, that opportunity just to cherish every moment. I think that's, I think you're very, I don't know if you're lucky. I don't know if you're blessed. I don't know how to, to term it, but you being able to look back on that and not be bitter that your dad died early, but instead see it as a, almost a blessing. It, it sounds like, um, because it meant so much to you, those, those time you did have. Um, cause a lot of people would look at that and be mad. Yes, sir. You know, that their dad died at 55, which is young. Yes, sir. Very young, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So for you to have a positive, um, outlook on it or just interpret it positively is that's a blessing. Yes, sir. Um, I guess I've, I don't really feel like any of us deserve what we're been given. Like, I feel like the fact that I'm able to walk, the fact that I'm able to breathe and live and live in this country. And it's like, man, I don't deserve any of this because, mm -hmm. you know, Romans three twenty three says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Like I know that m better about me than anybody, mm -hmm. but I still get these blessings every day. Mm -hmm. And for a while I got to thinking that maybe it was like works based. I was like, man, I'm like, I'm doing something right, you know? And then I was like, no, no, no. Everybody has access to these blessings and we all have them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's some people that have a lot less than, than others, but there's still, so anyways, when I, I think once I get going down this trail of like, I don't deserve any of it, well, mm -hmm. then it's like when my dad passed at 55, like, man, how much of a, I'm just glad that we got to live, have him in the time that we did. Yeah. And, um, and I'm also blessed that he was such a good dad, mm -hmm. you know, and he was, and because I was at the funeral home and I don't know the other people's situation during their, we were doing the visitation during another family's, it was in separate rooms, but I was like, I felt empathetic to them, like thinking like, man, I hope that their relationship was the, with their dad was the same as mine. Right. And I began to feel sorry for him if it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so there's also that, that I got, you know, I, the, the time I had, I remember like just a couple of weeks before my dad died, we were practicing. I was getting on a bucking horse. And when you buck horses, it takes like five or six people. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of part. Well, like we were doing it with just my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. And so my dad was on the pickup horse, opening the gate. And my mom was flanking the horse and also slapping him. Anyways, it was just, you don't do that with yeah. just two people. You need five. And, uh, but I was just soaking up every, he was such a cowboy. Yeah. I, What's what's his name? Coke. Coke. C O K E. Man, I don't know. I just I really envy um, your approach to that and your just being cognizant of you know what your dad's life meant and what those moments meant. It's just it, um, I'm very envious of that. That's a special thing you have, and to be able to look at it as you said, you know, you, you focus on the positive and the blessings and the time you spent with him and and the impact he's had on you and um well i one thing I, I appreciate you saying that and one thing that comes to mind that i have to follow this up with is i would never like there's a lot of similarities and and it was it was crazy the similarities reading your book but i would never tell someone i know how you feel mm -hmm. I, I didn't even say that to my brother and sister and mm -hmm. it's the same dad yeah because every relationship is so unique mm -hmm. and every person's experiences even if the relationships are the same each of those persons experiences are different mm -hmm. and like where they are in life i mean and so i i would never say like you should think this or that or like i'm not going to tell somebody the way they mm -hmm. need to feel about losing a loved one just because man it's you never know somebody's struggle. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, man, life is tough. Some, yes, you know, sir. Every, you know, we have to face this, we have to face death. It's, uh, we cherish in the positives, like our experiences the last couple of days we've had, and that's great, but we are going to face challenges too. And so I, when you're, when you're on the mountain though, 
There's probably not a time you've drawn your bow back that you haven't thought about Roy, huh? Not, not that I can recall. I mean, he's <laughs> like it. He's there. It's a little bit. It, it was different for me too because I had, I had put him on a pedestal and thought that you know, on one hand, I knew that the mountains can win. They can always win. Yes, sir. We are, um, we're immortal, and or I mean. <laughs> Life is precious, I guess is how I want to say it. We aren't immortal. But um, I thought he was almost um, indestructible, indestructible in some ways because he had taken on every challenge. He had always, always come out, regardless of what happened, always come out. I was always positive and it always worked out. It always did. And so, you know, when I got the call that he had fallen, on one hand, I couldn't believe it. Yes, Another sir. hand, I was like, well, it was, it was bound to happen because the mounds are dangerous. It's, you know, the hunts that we like to do, there's risk involved. So it was like, I really wrestled with that. And then I, w I wrestled with being also mad that he was only 49 and we had a lot of hunts that we wanted to do. And then, then I would, it was just kind of confusing because then I would say, well, he went out, you know, we talked about it yesterday, doing what he loved to do in the setting that he loved more than anything. So it was like, man, it, it was never cut and dry for me. It yes, was, in, and so that's why I say I'm envious um, of your situation, not your situation, but your attitude or just how you're internalizing it. Um, Cause it seems very healthy. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy for you. Well, I, I felt that that same, so like my dad had told me like, twice in a conversation, but once right before he died, like he was like, I feel like, I feel like I'm supposed to accomplish something great and I haven't yet. And he's like, he said that verbatim. And he's like, I don't know what it is, but there's just something deep in me, like something, I'm supposed to do something great. And so me driving from Paris to San Antonio, like I was going 90 miles an hour, kind of uh, punching the steering wheel and the ceiling. And I was like, I know it's supposed to happen soon. Like I was having this conversation with God, like I know before he you died. You told me, no, this is the night he died. Oh, okay. Like they called me, and they were like, "He's gone." I was like, oh, "Okay." I was like, "I knew it was going to happen soon, mm -hmm. but like, he hadn't done that thing yet, mm -hmm. and he was supposed to." And then I began to realize, like, as you know, my dad would talk about the butterfly effect, the ripple effect, the ripple effect of his death, you know, and all these people started to come out of the woodwork of people he had affected. Mm -hmm. Um. And like, I'll, I'll still run into people today that he either rodeoed with, or he was an ag teacher too. So he might've ranched with them at the pitchfork or he taught them an ag and they would tell me stories. And it's just like, th that's his life. And then this cherry on top of him being blessed with this exit, doing what he appreciated being horseback at a rodeo, like that 55 years, like that was the great thing. Yeah, he and it, did it. And God was going to put this stamp on it where it made everybody realize like, dang, this this man was, and I got to see it firsthand because there was a lot with our family where we got spread out and he his, his faith pulled us back together where most people would give up on mm -hmm. a family. People told him to give up. Anyway, there's a, that's a whole nother book, much less a podcast, but his faith... We would say strength and honor, but really it meant faith and loyalty. Mm. And so when he died, it just put a cap on his life that was just like, that is the great thing. And so now I can't get on the back of those shoots. Like I was about to get on the other day and my brother walked up right as we were about to buck mm -hmm. and I'm over the shoot, I'm about to get on. And this is just at the house and just having my brother there. Mm -hmm. And like I crawl down, I get on him. And then I just think about my dad and I get emotional and I got to get out and start over. Mm -hmm. And when you see that from the outside, you think, oh man, this guy's scared. And so that's what it looked like. But I was just so overcome, like in that moment, I was doing what I love. I was doing that thing. And I just, that's why that you, in your, your, your podcast with Michael Chandler, y'all talked about the, you know, every guy needs a fight mm -hmm. and you're referring to the book wild at heart and just, pursuing that fight brings me closer to my dad than like when you got what did you think about when you said you thought about your dad what do you think about <sighs> like he he would whenever he would get on a bucking horse he would pull his hat down mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. and it would it would crunch his ears down yeah and like that was that was him that was his moment and 
he would talk about he would talk about going to a place in that moment where your own mother doesn't recognize you. And just like that level of fight that, you know, like this, we're talking about bucking horses, that DJ Shipley SEAL team guy, like Tanner, like they know a real fight with stakes Mm -hmm. high, like military, like that stuff is the Mm -hmm. extreme. But like this rodeo is like a version of it for me where it's like a a true fight, man versus beast. And just Mm -hmm. as a man being able to go there Mm -hmm. and get that mindset that... and so like I picture my dad and when I picture those ears down mm-hmm. and him over the shoots, like I'm over the shoots and then yeah. my brother's right there, it just, it, man, it brings to, it's just so pure and perfect. What would he say when it was time to open the gate, the shoot? Buck em. Yeah. Let's buck em. You know, mm-hmm. he'd, all right, boys. Just in a real, you don't want to be too loud. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be, okay, buck em. You know, because mm-hmm. the animals. They're mm-hmm. used to that, and mm-hmm. they'll anticipate it. And so right. then they might, before the gate opens, they'll slam right. or do something. So it'd be real calm, mm-hmm. you know, be like, all right, boys, let's buck them. Mm-hmm. And, and so, like, you, sometimes, sometimes guys just nod. Mm-hmm. But if they don't see the nod, if, you'll, if, if I like to say that, mm-hmm. but you got to do it, like, real, real steady. Calm, yeah. Even Is though that what you say, too? All right, boys. All right, boys, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Man, um... I didn't mean to get all that deep on you. I wasn't. Expect- no, I didn't plan on talking like this. Oh, it's it's good. I mean, most I, of my life is comedy, but <laughs> this is. Well, I think you know a lot of what you do. Obviously, there's passion, and it means something. It's like, yeah, you make you might make jokes out of a lot of it, but you care. You, this is a lifestyle that you're trying to highlight and share, and that's because of your dad. You know, yes, your sir. dad brought you up to cherish what you do with, with rodeo and with animals and with ranching. And, and so you're just carrying on that legacy just in your own way. Yes, sir. And I think it's amazing what you're doing because we're driving, you know, through town or running yesterday and people pulling over at the restaurant and people like, could I get a picture with Dale Brisby? It's like, (laughs) so I don't know what your, what your dad thought you were going to get to in your life, but I bet he'd be proud right now. He, he died two months before the first video okay so we 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 did a lot of prank calls up to that point for three Mm -hmm. years i prank called and he was one of them (laughs) yeah the first video happened july 1st 2013 Mm -hmm. my buddy mitch montgomery posted it for me and um yeah and so ever since ever it's been this july will be 10 years Mm -hmm. that we've been making videos and and it all happened kind of i don't i don't want to say by accident Cause he posted it on purpose, but like we were just trying, I just, I've always been a class clown. I like making, making people laugh. Yeah. And so it came about as like a, a natural thing. And then we added, I didn't even know how to monetize YouTube videos for like two and a half years. Yeah. Like I was using copyrighted music and <laughs> we added the, the money came later. Okay. So the branding, looking back, we were branding a product without knowing it. Yeah. Like I was saying, rodeo building time. a brand. Yes, yeah. sir. We were building a brand without mm-hmm. knowing it. And then, I was like, well, dang, we could just, I could just keep doing this and then I'd be able to rodeo more. Yeah. And that's why I did it. And then had a few injuries at back, back surgeries and whatnot, took me out of the game for a couple of years. And I pushed the gas on content. Mm. And now that I'm healthy, I've also, you know, got this business that I've built behind me. And so I'm having to navigate pursuing this selfish dream but also take care of all these families. And yeah. So, but it's a, it's fun. It's a good problem to have. Yeah, it is. Well, you're doing a great job with it. Um, What what do you think your dad would think of where you're at now? Oh, my gosh. He'd be grinning ear to ear. Really? He would love it. He would yeah. absolutely love it. He'd be annoying with all the ideas. <laughs> Every day he'd have 40 ideas of what I should do or film <laughs> or... But, oh, man, he would have been the biggest Cam Haynes fan. Oh, Cause he, he bow hunted and he, mm-hmm. he was like, you know, I wished he'd have had a little more of your physical fitness desires, you know, mm-hmm. he wasn't out of shape, but I mean, yeah, he, he, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what causes heart attacks. It doesn't sound like anybody does, but yeah, I mean, he was a cowboy. He was horseback. He was freaking active when he died, you know, yeah. so it's just a freak deal, but no, he'd be excited right now. Would he? Yeah. He'd probably he'd be excited. You were on the Yellowstone. Do you know you were on oh Yellowstone? Gosh, that was Can wild. you believe that? Yeah, me and Taylor Sheridan. 
he's my movie best friend. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a good that's a good one to have. Yes, yeah, sir. He's on a roll right now. He's doing a lot for the industry. Yeah, you know, and I, I, we all appreciate him. What I like about it is, it seems like it's it's real. Like the 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 horse work out there, it's like it's mm -hmm. legit. And they're kind of um, they're educating the viewer at mm -hmm. the same time, you right? Know, because most people don't know what you guys do, hundred percent. And they're seeing it out there, and they're talking about it right, and they're doing it right. From my perspective, I don't you you might have a different one, but it looks like it's like okay, this is a lifestyle that's more accurate than what we've seen before, showing. Uh, some wrinkles that, <laughs> that add um, authenticity to it. You bet. And I, I like even just the doctoring up the animals. Right. You know? I like well, he, that. He does a good job with, you got, I mean, there's got to be a story. There's got to be mm -hmm. the drama. There's got to be something to keep people interested. And so he does a great job of, and, and that's why he is who he is. I mean, all these movies he's made, you know, mm -hmm. the scripts he's written and, and, and stories he's written. And so he does a good job, like keeping people interested, but then also maintaining the authenticity of the industry. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like he himself is, a, he's a phenomenal horseman. And so like he, he plays his character, Travis, you know, you see yeah. him horseback and, and there's, there's authenticity to that, that, mm -hmm. that the industry appreciates. Yeah. So, um, and that's what I hope to convey. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm doing it on a smaller scale, but with comedy and, um, you know, we did have the Netflix show and, and there's, we should find out pretty soon about more episodes coming, but, um, but essentially I want to be an ambassador for my faith and, and the industry. And, um, I want to be a positive light. You know, I'm sure you get tempted sometimes to jump into politics and, while I'm not at all ashamed of what I believe, yeah. I'm also like see myself as like, like I said, this happened for me personally, not on accident, but it's it's so easy for me to point to this was God's plan. Mm -hmm. And I, he put me in the category of comedian, cowboy comedian. Mm -hmm. And and so there's there's issues I like to address, but I'm also here to be that. Yeah. And I want people to take a break from their day, entertain them, entertain them, mm -hmm. and it be wholesome and make them feel good. And they escape from those things because there's so much that I would love yeah. to just, I mean, <laughs> like get cancel me. Let me just say these five things yeah. that are against, that are not politically correct, right. cancel me. But I also want to respect where God put me. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you have those. And maybe there, and, and to be honest, there will come a day when I do, when I am asked something on mm -hmm. a platform and it, and maybe it does get me canceled, but yeah, it's all in God's plan. Yeah. No, I understand that. Um, is, is that where your faith came from, from your dad or where, where does, where'd this come from? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. It came from my dad. And there were also moments, you know, like I took a, I took a, a religions class in college, um, I needed an extra credit. It wasn't like my, my major or anything, but it was at Texas A&M and it was, I think the guy was a Christian, but this was not a biased class. Like mm -hmm. we were studying different religions and so many religions. And so the way the textbook laid it out was it would have, you know, these are their principles. This is their God or gods. This is their, what they read. And then this is their path to salvation. Mm -hmm. So all these religions, the last thing we studied was their path to salvation. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed was they, all of them with the exception of Christianity had some type of work to it. Like you had to do these things. There's a list. And, but Christianity was, you had to have faith in Jesus that he was, that he's Lord. And, um, that faith is what saves you, mm -hmm. you know, and he is the substitute for, um, what we are not. And that's what he did on the cross. And that made the most sense to me because mm -hmm. I, I know that I've sinned. Mm -hmm. And if I want to make it to a perfect place, which all these religions had some sort of heaven that was perfect. Okay. Well, it makes sense that imperfect things are not welcome there. All right. Well, we're all imperfect. And so it took Christ, you know, and what he did on the cross, but we can't earn that. And so it took faith in what he did on the cross for us to get to heaven. And that just, it just clicked mm -hmm. from and that the, college class. It, that was one layer. And then I read this book, mere Christianity. It's by CS Lewis. Mm -hmm. He's the one that does uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. He's a former atheist mm -hmm. and mere Christianity is a book. They call it the book for the unconvinced. And so, cause I began to like wonder, like I'm, you know, I'm not saying I got curious and I'm like, 
going to throw out the Bible in college, but it's just like you see all these other things. Yeah. So I read Mere Christianity, and um, it's a former atheist explaining, and he doesn't use a lot of scripture in there, but he explains Christianity and just logically Mm -hmm. how it makes sense. And I'm not even going to, I'm not going to do it justice by trying to explain it, but it blew my mind. Mm. And I sent it to some of my friends that were on the fence and we just, I just couldn't put it down. And it was written, you know, 70 years ago, but, um, didn't you send me one? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I've sent out probably half a dozen to Mm -hmm. like some of my closest friends and some of the spots you, I know what it did for me Mm -hmm. in terms of like my faith. And that's when you touch on faith in there, I just thought like, man, he, but, um, yeah, that letter and that, um, book meant a lot to me. Well, that's cool. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I was hoping at the time, you know, like I didn't, you didn't know who I was. And so I didn't want it to be too much, but yeah, it's one of the nicest letters I've ever got. So. Well, that, it just, it was such a divine thing, me reading that book. Like it just wasn't like, I've read a lot of books this last year mm-hmm. and that one was just, it was just, it wasn't random. Like I don't believe in like coincidences. And mm-hmm. Anyway, that one was, there's no way that was a coincidence. Yeah. And so anyhow, I, that's why, I, you know, I've been a, I was a Cam Haynes fan before that, but then the book just kind of helped take it to another level. So, um, well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird that a lot of times faith from ki- the kid's faith is from the mother a lot of times. I don't know if it's because um, dads are working, they're busy, they don't have time, moms have more time maybe to read the Bible. I don't know, but it feels like a lot of that influence comes from the mother to their kids. Yes, sir. But you say it came from your dad. Yes, sir. Okay. And maybe it was maybe the way he was raised. You know, and my and my mom was raised. Uh, my, mom, <laughs> my mom was the the black. She's where I get the the humor side of. Mm-hmm. You know, like golly, it's funny the all the ways she would make jokes about my old man, try to make him uncomfortable. Like she would make, you know, like inappropriate jokes about there. <laughs> anyway, but like <laughs> she's just always she's a goober. But she was like the black sheep, and mm-hmm. um, she she liked to to drink a little when we were younger, and she had a little bit of a good time and my dad was just always kind of the rock that brought us all back to, Hmm. you know, the plum Bob as uh, Wayne was saying yesterday. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, she, she, she's a believer and, you know, she did have some times in our life where she was, you know, enjoying it a little too much, but now she's leading Bible studies and, you know, like she, she's a strong Christian and always has been. Um, but my, my dad was undoubtedly just the rock that Mm. all of our, my family's faith was built on Mm. and uh and my mom would agree with me there like he was just looking back like he was just a perfect man and he had flaws he he was he also had sins obviously but just he he he's the kind of man that i i hope i am for this country for my family you know like he kind of like how jordan peterson i think you guys have referenced it somebody that's a dangerous man but able to be in control and maybe that's where him pulling his hat down and crunching his ears, mm-hmm. like that was the epitome of that for me. Yeah. Seeing that. Right. But, yeah. But I know a lot of families where exactly what you just said, like the, the, yeah. the mom was like, they could quote the scripture and they mm-hmm. could, and then, and, <clears throat> but I think both are great. Yeah. Obviously. You know? Yeah. Two, two, uh, working towards the same goal would be, would be the best situation most like you ideal. and tracy like anyway i'm a fan of you and you and your wife that like seeing her and, and you next to each other seems like i, I, I i'm just i'm just a fan so i don't want to speak on something <laughs> i don't know a lot about but uh, uh, she's she's better than me on on as far as that goes just uh i do my best i i can get better um, she's definitely leading the charge on that and I'm trying to learn and catch up and do the right thing and make good decisions. And, uh, yeah, I'm definitely, I have many flaws, but trying every day, yeah. <laughs> trying my best. But, uh, yeah, thank you for saying that. She's, she's been great. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the person I am or in this position without support from my wife for sure. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, what's your, so what's your goal 
for Dale Brisby Incorporated. What I mean, what where's this thing going? We yes, see, sir. We see what you're doing now, and it's just having this huge impact, and it's fun and exciting, and people love it. What's your vision? Uh, I took I took the guys, took all the interns to a ranch recently, the R.A. Brown Ranch, and it's just kind of like a t um, taking all these interns. I have nine, and uh, on a field trip, so to speak, where they see another working ranch. And the Donnell Brown, the, the the man that owns it and runs it, he he went around the group and he asked everybody what their five year plan was, and and it got to me. I had not been asked that recently, right? And he he said, and I said, to be honest, if I'm doing exactly what I'm doing today in five years, that will be a success. And I love the thing that drives my business is the part that I enjoy, which is making the videos, making the content, mm -hmm. making you know skits or vlogs or podcasts. Like I enjoy being a class clown goober. We just turn on a camera now. And then on the entrepreneurial side of things, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. Um, we weren't the poorest people in town. People had less, but we didn't have a lot. And so I, I think I have this like fear of being poor. And so that drives me on the business side. Mm. But the thing that makes that possible is this other thing I love, which is the branding. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why... And the way we came about the branding was authentic, so I'm not doing it for the money. And I believe that God has just put all these things in my life for it to... So to be honest, I just want to keep building. And mm -hmm. we were talking about how each podcast is a brick. A Netflix show is a brick, and some bricks are bigger than others, but I'm just one brick at a time every day, every Snapchat reel. And, you know, Lord willing, I'm... I'm still doing this same thing. I mean, like we, we both been saying it this whole trip, like we love this life. Like how yeah. awesome is it that this is our job? Yeah, it's and true. So I have not taken one day for granted, but I had a guy stop by, he was an ag teacher and he was like, what are you going to do if all this ends? And I, first of all, I, I said, well, what are you going to do if your job ends? You know, I was <laughs> yeah. like, my no dad guarantees. was an ag teacher. Mm -hmm. Like the superintendent could walk in and fire you tomorrow. Yeah. But, a lot of people don't know how at peace I was with my job before this, which was just cowboying. Mm. And that's the happiest I've ever been. I was make, I was working for my brother-in-law. He was raising yearlings. And so I was doctoring yearlings and then mm -hmm. day working. And like, if I had to go back to that, like, I, I don't know. Like what does a, that pay? A good day working job is 125 a day. Sometimes one, now it's kind of come up inflation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so everybody's getting paid about 150 a day, but you bring your own truck, you pay for your own diesel, your mm -hmm. contract labor, mm -hmm. you got your own horses. And now I have all those things. And so I guess I could go back to day working <laughs> and just like have better horses than I did. Yeah. You know, but no, I, I love doing what I do and I just want to, I just want to keep making and, and hopefully another big brick, like, you know, a Netflix style show comes along, but if it doesn't, then I'll survive. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, tech, Cost of living where I live in Texas is pretty cheap. Is it? Um, what's so. been your mo What's been your best selling T shirt? You ain't no cowboy. Oh, I got a I got a, a rodeo time shirt that oh. is pretty. It's it's yeah. So that my apparel that's the the main source of revenue for us, and so that's that's what I love doing is growing the apparel company Rodeo Time. It, you make more than one hundred and fifty a day doing that. I make more than one hundred and fifty a day, so <laughs> I get to pay people. So. 150 a day so well, that that's and now you got sponsors yourself look at right this. Yes. mountain ops hoodie you're out there living the the mountain ops life there's a few i've, I've only got a few sponsors i get contacted a lot mm. but i keep it kind of at a minimal because i want them to be like super authentic yeah and i've always been passionate about my health not not on a cam haynes level i'm getting there but not on a <laughs> cam haynes level you're doing great so the partnership with Mountain Ops was, that was a no brainer for me. I mean, I was already taking the stuff whenever the opportunity came about. So mm -hmm. I think that's also, you know, American Hats, Total Feeds, like these are all products I'm using. And then the relationship happened, which yeah. I think is authentic, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, but Mount, Mountain Ops is, well, they're a wonderful company and they kept me going. Mm -hmm. So you need to get Craig Jackson on there. Hey, hey, Truett. 
where's my where's my sponsorship <laughs> that was so, so awesome it was part of the q a we did last night we made a prank call to Truett, my son who works for mountain ops and and dale was craig jackson yeah looking craig. for a sponsorship <laughs> that's back to my og like prank phone call days yeah craig he's a good dude you know that instagram got canceled on him and <laughs> they're just soft on instagram they don't like seeing shirtless men you know do chin-ups but <laughs> oh, true it's gonna get me hooked up uh, he yeah definitely he sounded like he, that's a guaranteed deal five thousand a month even yeah i mean that's <laughs> it's it's an honest you know 60 grand a year. <laughs> yeah that was great man uh so much fun with you so what what has stood out from you on this trip so what I love doing, I love bringing people who I look up to or follow or get entertained by with you, or I see you as an outlier in, in this entertainment field that you're, you're like one of the, I don't know of any, there probably are some cowboys that are out doing maybe entertaining things, but none that I know of. So to me, you're the outlier in that field. Um, how has this experience been to you for you coming in here, lift, run, shoot, bow rack, well, Everything. first, like yesterday, I had like deja vu. We were driving. I was like, oh, wait, you run on this road. And so like it's been surreal to get to see, you know, the monument up close and the rock the, yeah. that says Poser on it up close and this room. And so that part was just as a fan, you know, um, what do they call it? Fangirl. And, you know, that part was cool. <laughs> but also I wanted to stretch myself physically. I wanted to be a part of that and mm -hmm. i know there were times yesterday where you were uh babysitting me but also like it it it's it's just hard work it's there's not like this you're not like a, a magician mm -hmm. you just work really hard and so it gave me hope seeing that like okay i've just got to turn up the work ethic a little yeah. in the mornings and that's possible mm -hmm. and so that was neat and then something that i didn't I mean, I didn't think it wasn't going to be a thing, but like the production that you guys and the the thought you put behind everything is um, sometimes it just from the outside looking in, things just seem like they they come not that they come easy, but that it's just simple. Mm -hmm. You know, you just put up a podcast, mm -hmm. and I've struggled to have good production, but like you guys are just like you work so hard at getting everything right. And uh, that has stretched me um, and challenged me as a creator. Mm -hmm. Not to mention just get, I, sh I shot a bow like a little in college just because my dad did and I wanted to get back to that. And But I, I never took it serious. And so it was awesome. And then he, then he passed and so I couldn't ask him anything about bow hunting. Mm -hmm. Not that he was on your level, but and so that was awesome to get to learn the right way. Yeah. And well, that's important, I think, no matter what you're doing, especially like rodeo. like Right. Because there's a lot of people out there that will say they're experts. And and there's no checks on it mm -hmm. with this industry. You yeah. know, like people yeah. can just claim that. Yeah. And uh, so that was cool to get. I want to start laying a foundation for, for that because... Mm -hmm. I've hunted with a rifle, and I think that probably every hunter that hunters hunts with a rifle will probably like deep down agree with this, even though they may never actually. <laughs> but like, there's something superior about being able to kill an animal with a bow. Mm -hmm. And my excuse for using a rifle was I had not put in the work with a bow, right? And I didn't want to like just cripple mm -hmm. a deer, you know? Yeah. Which is a good excuse, that, except for the fact reason. it's because I was being lazy <laughs> and not, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's yeah. that part of it. Well, there is a lot of time challenges for everybody, you know, trying to pay the bills and do things. So I understand if people m might not have the dedication <laughs> of time to be an ethical bow hunter, but I understand, totally understand what you're saying. The, the one form of like, I don't know if you call it hunting or fishing that I thought, you might super enjoy mm -hmm. have you ever thought about noodling oh yeah i have yeah do you I follow mean, hannah Barron? yeah of yeah. course yeah i just saw her at in uh at the hunt expo in utah she's her and her dad you would love jeff Barron. yeah i met him you did okay yeah, yeah. good he had, his shirt, oh. he had the sleeves cut off on his shirt that's cam yeah. haynes and jeff Barron. that's the greatest combination ever <laughs> um 
but reaching down in those holes yeah and those big old fish because you went and did that with them oh yeah we go every summer oh okay it's like my that's my that's my hunting trip right now yeah but it looks fun and she's a mountain ops girl yeah and but it is such a rush man you got to try it someday yeah i was impressed she killed a bull this year with her bow she uh, did and, was it with a bow yeah she worked her butt off i mean it took i think she had to extend her trip a couple of days and finally got an arrow in a bull and got it killed didn't she go with uh uh trump not donald the the uh the oh, son? a rifle hunt maybe that was a rifle hunt i did, didn't know but she went with donald trump jr yeah th she was with rihanna on the bow hunt okay yeah. Cool. I didn't realize she did that with a bow. Yeah. I, she may have killed another bull, maybe with Christy Lee Cook and Donald Trump. Yep. I believe that. I remember seeing that trip, but I know Rihanna and her were in Idaho and, and they killed. I remember seeing the picture of her with the bull with Rihanna, but sometimes the thing about pictures of Hannah is you kind of get locked in on Hannah. She's yeah. not hard, bad to look at. And yeah. So, yeah. So but there might have been a bull there. I don't it know. Might have been a, <laughs> might have been a maybe, bull. There. Maybe just her with a bow. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Another ex girlfriend of mine. <laughs> But, uh, no, I, I could see you reaching down into a catfish hole. That yeah. would be awesome. No, it looks, it looks fun. I mean, I like that people, I think their teeth kind of cut up the arms and stuff. Sometimes there's blood and that's yeah. kind of cool. But, um, yeah, I mean, so to your point about pushing yourself, uh, all I know is that when we were run, starting off running yesterday, I was like, this guy can run. So <clears throat> I don't know if you want to say you were pushed, but you were like, a great pace and then you got in the gym here and uh are jacked it's like i know you wear some big hoodie under but you got some sneaky muscles under there because <laughs> when we got the the pump going on the bench yesterday it's like you're definitely jacked so i don't know what you're talking about as far as being pushed but you, you look like you put in the work and then also you i'm just gonna have to say it you set the record on the balloon pop 90 yards because you go 90 with everything oh so bull pumped. riding uh, bucking horses and shooting the, shooting the bow, right? I was so pumped to get that 90 yard shot. 90 and it yards. took forever. It felt like it took like six seconds of flight time. I was like, <laughs> that arrow I think was I missed air. pop. I was like, yeah. oh, we hit it. We were looking for where that arrow was going to go. And then here it comes. Boom. That pop, was so cool. You know, yeah. and, and I saw uh, what was Natalie yeah. get jacked when she shot it. And I can't. Did she get jacked? Yeah, I think she did. Yeah, get yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was. <laughs> and I was thinking like, I was thinking like, oh man, I hope I have that same energy. And it's just popping that balloon at 90 yards. Like I, didn't, awesome. I didn't have to fake anything. No, we were hot. we were jumping around and hugging. We were like rocking Apollo on the beach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just needed a little short shorts. I cannot wait to have that feeling with, for me, the next animal I think would be a pig. They're pretty, pretty big yeah, nuisance. So that'd be, yeah, with the bow. Oh so, man, I can't wait to see it. I see them a lot on my run yeah. in the morning, so I might just take my bow with me. Those are perfect bow hunting animals because they can't see very well. Yes. You know, so you get the wind right, get in there, get into bow range. Of course, if a big old boar hog, uh, stay away from that shield. I, I do sometimes keep a, a gun on me on those runs mm -hmm. and like that. I mean, like, I've been as close as, like, this table to a pig on my runs. That's like, bow range, it? Isn't it does not it, <laughs> it just happens often. And so, like, I really think. Yeah. But I don't I almost said, I don't know if I'd want to run with a bow, but you carry, we carried a 72-pound rock up this mm -hmm. mountain. Yeah. <laughs> a four-pound bow probably won't yeah, hurt no, us. Yeah, I think you'll be all right. Yeah. See, that's why we train. So that's the whole philosophy be behind train hard, hunt easy. We train with a, a rock, 72 pound rock. So then that bow is easy. Yes. So that's a whole that's point. That's so true. It. Well, with, on your bow hunt, you're going to need a bow. And that's what we have right here. Oh, man, I saw this and I was wondering so like, look at, look at this thing. This is your keep hammering. This is a top of the line Hoyt right oh here. Oh my gosh. Check out that bow. It's so light and perfect. The Ventum Pro 30. This that, is amazing. Yeah, that'll spank them right there. I, uh, I've i given, oh, I've given a few gifts, but none of them have been like this uh, to like my podcast guests. None of them have been bow worthy. And look at this. See how it's all black? You know what we call that? Murdered out. Murdered out. Murdered out because it's a bow. Murdered out. I actually old didn't notice this right here saying keep hammering. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, bad to the bone. That's your bow. You shot it. 
amazing yesterday. Um, it's, I, I got something for you though. You do? So I was, I was, uh, I, I was studying. I watched every Keep Hammering Collective podcast that came out. All right. When they came out. And uh, I was like, I think he might be going to give me a bow. But I wasn't expecting it. I was like, maybe he might not, though, too. So don't get And so, just anyways, in case. A few. There's only about a dozen of these, and my closest friends have them. Oh, man. It's not worth There's one of my hairs on it. Yeah. Monetarily, it's not worth as much as that this is, bow, for sure. But That is cool. Tell me my, what this means to you. Um. Well, so that one is the first one. My brother just got into silver work. So this one was f- made by a friend that passed, Rick McCumber. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that one there, my brother made. Okay. And um, so that, it means a lot n- for that. But the reason why I give them to my closest friends, it's just a, uh, that, that faith that my dad instilled in me, you know, for some reason, you know, down there in Texas, we get a lot of red tail hawks, and mm-hmm. and that was always something special to me. Just seeing those, it was just kind of like a hopeful moment, you know. Not that, and and getting to see those, but to 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 tell you the truth, I haven't been able to really verbalize all the ways that this wing, you know, means to me. But like, it's just a. I guess it's a lot like that scripture we talked about yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, I was getting nervous about the run, and so I got on the the Bible app and the verse of the day, it was Romans 5, 3 and 5, and it said, uh, rejoice in suffering. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope, and uh, which comes from Jesus Christ. And anyways, I guess that line of things that happened in my life, this little wing gives me hope. Yeah. And um, my brother actually gave me the first one, and then... I had it remade by Rick, and then he remade it again. Now that he's into silverwork, so it's come full circle. And oh wow! It'd be you don't wear this, necklaces, but this, it would maybe a cool keychain or something. This means a lot to me. Thank so, you, thank you. Just knowing that story and and why it's important to you, of course, makes it important to me also. Yes, sir. Um, we're on this journey together. We're here to be. We're we're we live this life to be here for each other and help elevate each other and and support and because this is so meaningful to you it's it's likewise meaningful to me and i i really thank you well i appreciate it and i I wore two of them you probably heard it jangling the audio (laughs) guys probably hated it yesterday but i wore it yesterday on the mountain that was just the easy way to transport it and so it's the one dale brisby wore on mount pitska while we were (laughs) well thank you brother yes sir thank you for the bow and thank you for this opportunity no, it's been been my pleasure. Um, can't wait to share this discussion with everybody and share the lift run shoot with everybody. You've been everything, and I hope you'd be. Thank you very much, Dale. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> pow pow. All right, we're out of here. Keep hammering. Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I lose. Every comment, hate that makes my feel gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with, giving my blood so I am relentless. My fault, they want someone to blame They sent the hate, it fuels my pace I am Roy Tuff, I am the change, the few endure Feeling like campaign